Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So, um, a few times in the past I've found myself um, in melee games and other kind of sparring situations where I've been uh, wanting to use my good old favourite sabre or any other kind of one-handed sword. And this could apply to you if you're used to using side sword, for example, or, um, or broadsword, back sword, um, anything like this, possibly even a rapier as well. And um, I've found myself in situations where uh, maybe uh, we've been training melee games, as I say, or um, situations where we've been looking at fighting multiple opponents. And it's interesting because when you put yourself in this kind of scenario, you kind of think, well, okay, if I'm gonna, if I was gonna fight and use any weapon available to me, I'm still probably going to use the hand weapon that I'm most comfortable using, uh, but I want to stick something in my other hand. Now, obviously when um, we're looking at military saber treatises, um, and for lots of people who are looking at, um, you know, backsword or broadsword, things like this, there isn't, it isn't dealt with what you, what you really do with your other hand, except for get it out of the way, and possibly for grabbing and grappling and things like this. Now, we all know um, that in the 18th and 19th centuries, and in fact into the 20th centuries, we'd often have a handgun in the left hand. And obviously for cavalry, um, often cavalry would be holding the reins of their horse. Uh, for someone on foot, you might have a, um, a pistol, might be single shot, double shot, could be a revolver um, in your left hand. Um, but assuming that that's not available to you, either because you're fighting in an environment where um, you might be out of ammunition, you might have already shot uh, people with your pistol might only be a single shot pistol um, or for some reason you don't have access to a pistol or indeed if it's pre-pistol age so if we're looking at you know say um, the 15th century for example um, and you've got an arming sword so what do you put in your left hand well we all know there's lots of different options you could put another weapon in your other hand in terms of like another sword or a dagger uh, you could indeed put a buckler or you can put a shield in the other hand. Now, this got me around to thinking. So, shields are great. Okay, shields have all kinds of huge advantages. Firstly, I'll just tell you about this shield uh, very briefly. This is a shield which is sold. Um, I bought this through the Night Shop or Hema Shop, um, same company, and uh, it's. I highly recommend it. It's made. Um, it's made in India. Um, but it's, I think it's 14 gauge mild steel. It's got a good pad, good straps on the back. It's been durable. It's not taken any serious dents. It's got a few dents in it. Um, I haven't used it a huge amount, uh, but I've used it a fair bit and I've used it in melee um, and uh, single combat as well. Um, and I love it. Um, I think it could do to be a little bit bigger. Um, so it's primarily marketed as a Rotella. Um, a Rotella, sometimes known as a Rondash in Arms and Armour books, but in the treatises usually, Italian treatises anyway, usually described as a Rotella. Um, and that being a round, as you can see, it's domed shield. The advantage of it being domed um, is multiple. Maybe I'll deal with that um, in, an, in a different video comparing this with flat shields, but uh, fundamentally it, it provides more protection um, to, to the um, arm holding it by it being domed. Um, and it makes it stronger when it's made out of metal because it's more able to resist and deflect blows. Um, but uh, this is a really cool type of shield and it's a, um, this kind of strap shield, I won't say strapped exactly in this way, but a circular domed strapped shield is something that we find over a very wide period of time over a diverse set of cultures. So you can find it in 19th century India, as the Dal, you can find it in uh, 14th century Mamluk Egypt, you can find it in Persia, you can find it in, um, in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. So you can find it all over the place even, I mean, we could even say, you know, they were, they were using strapped round shields in antiquity as well to some extent, the hoplite shield, um, although the, it's somewhat larger and heavier and strapped in a different way, but nevertheless, there are some parallels to be made there. But this is a really cool, diverse, um, sort of little shield. Now, obviously I study um, a lot of 19th century warfare and particularly colonial conflicts. And so um, I have come across sources that do describe um, British officers and Indian um, troops and Indian officers making use of the dal or the round shield, which is roughly this size and shape, um, although strapped a little bit differently to this. And um, 
It is an interesting thing because clearly if you're fighting in uh, the time of the Duke of Wellington in, or before he was the Duke of Wellington, um, uh, if you were fighting in uh, India in the early 1800s, for example, um, which was a period, you know, the time of Tipu Sultan, the time when there was a lot of um, British military activity in India and um, you were, had a sword. In this case, it wouldn't be that kind of sword. That's a Prussian 1852 for anyone who's interested, you might have something like this. So you might have a British officer's sword 1796 um, type thing of the period. And you might think, well, look, I'm engaged in melees. I'm going to have a couple of pistols, but they're going to get spent pretty soon. I want to have something a bit better protect, to protect me from uh, missile fire and other weapons. And so you might go for a shield and you might carry it. And we, we do know that this did occasionally happen with British um, troops, British officers, but equally we know that Obviously, Indian soldiers fighting um, for the British government did uh, carry their native weapons, including the shield, um, quite often, even even until after the Indian mutiny, even um, so, up until the middle of the 19th century. So, um, so we might end up with a shield and a um, uh, and a saber. But let's just assume for a second that you don't have really any idea what to do with a shield. Well, there's a few things that are obvious. So let's say that you're trained in European sabre. So you know all your guards, you know all your cuts, you generally speaking cut with a moulinet, um, and, um, but you're gonna use a shield. Well, there are a few things that are obvious. So if we look at these days, we've got access to medieval and Renaissance treatises. We can get those books out or get the PDFs off, uh, on, um, online and uh, read them and get an idea of what to do with the shield. But a 19th century um, European might not have that as an option. So what would they do? Well, first of all, you've got the, you've got the locals, haven't you? So whether you're in some part of, you know, like Africa, like the Sudan or something like that, or whether you're in India, um, or, or Afghanistan or somewhere else, you can look at what they do with their shields. Um, and you can kind of try and emulate that. But that might not work with the system of swordplay that you're comfortable with. For example, if you're used to standing right foot forward in this sort of right angled stance and using your saber in a certain way, you might find that trying to use the shield in the way that the, the natives or the locals use it doesn't really, isn't very conducive. So how could you, if you just pick up one of these shields, how could you combine that with the saber um, repertoire that you know. Well, you could do quite easily, and I have seen it done. Um, it, I don't know why I never thought to do this myself, but I saw someone many years ago in melee games do exactly this, and I copied them, and it worked surprisingly well. So I reverted to my normal saber repertoire, so I'm still attacking on a lunge, I'm still making circular cuts, okay, but I've now got a shield. What do I do with it? Well, quite simply, I held it there, okay? And then a little bit later on, I noticed that um, this other person had um, protected their head from someone who'd simply made a guard and repost because so many people repost with a cut number one, a downwards cut um, from the right at the head, um, that well, why instead of holding it here, that might protect your torso quite well from missiles and stuff like this and thrusts. Um, but actually, against if you're actually in close combat against someone who's cutting, then just do this. So it becomes a bit like a boxer's stance, doesn't it? And funnily enough, if you look up Thomas Page um, from the middle of the 18th century, 1746, I think his year is, um, he has a section on the use of the broadsword and targe used as you'd by, used by the Highlanders, um, as at the Battle of Culloden, for example, which was the year before, 1745. Um, now, Thomas Page is loved by some people and hated by others. He was, he was English. Um, I think he was in the artillery, although there's some conjecture about whether he was um, truthful about his military service. But he was English and he was writing a book about the use of the broadsword, um, uh, but he was also talking about the Highland system of sword and targe. Now, some people question whether it's genuine. Uh, it's definitely a genuine historical source, but some people question whether Thomas Page actually had seen or knew about the Highland sword and targe in use or whether he was just making it up. But nevertheless, some people follow it. 
I think it's a very interesting source. It's got no real close parallel. I mean, the only other main source to look at for broadsword and Taj uh, that's actually a treatise, really, is, um, is McBain, uh, and he does very different things. But anyway, in Thomas Page, essentially, bear in mind he has a basket hilt, not a stirrup hilt, so he's got a very protective enclosed hilt. He basically has the sword and the, um, the, sword and the shield up here. A bit like, a, like I say, like a boxer, like a modern boxer stance, because of course in modern boxing you've got huge great gloves, not like the old pugilists um, of the 19th century, but once you've got massive great 20th century gloves on, then you can basically do this and protect, um, guard your head with these great big shields, padded shields essentially. So... If you're, doing, if you're doing your sabre repertoire that you're completely used to doing, what you can do is just get your Taj or get your shield and stick it in front of the body and occasionally stick it up to the head. I wouldn't recommend sticking it over the head all the time because you seriously block your line of sight over here. And if you're in any kind of melee or um, you know, real combat, as it were, doing this is essentially like being a horse with, with, the, with those blinkers on. Okay, You're not going to be able to see someone attacking you from here and they'll just stab or cut below the line of the shield. Um, equally, someone's less likely to actually swing at your head if you're just holding it around like a great big helmet. Okay, So having it down here is better for vision, but is also better um, for protecting you from attacks that come in quickly without you necessarily seeing, um, for example, missiles. Okay, Now one other thing to say is with a steel shield like this, actually it has a very realistic potential of deflecting or stopping um, black powder bullets uh, or balls, okay, um, obviously not at close range from a musket, but at relatively close range from a pistol and indeed um, at longer range from a musket. We know, for example, that the French cuirassier um, breastplates stop musket balls beyond about 30 yards. So quite frankly, this is like having a bulletproof breastplate that you can move around and protect other bits of your body with. So actually in an 18th or 19th century battlefield, if you're allowed to carry one, I think this is an absolutely fantastic secondary weapon. And really, in many ways, I think they should have dished them out to officers because remember, the, the main duty of an officer is to stay alive and command the men. Well, this, absolutely increases your chance of staying alive. I would argue possibly even more than a pistol, but frankly, you can also have a pistol with this. You can hold a pistol in this hand or, or even other weapons as, you know, the dirk was held in the, um, in the other hand, um, in the Taj hand, for example, by the Highlanders. But um, you can actually still have a pistol or a pair of pistols or a revolver even and still have a shield and this is going to make you less vulnerable to shrapnel or to um, longer range shots and of course much more effective in close to clo clo um, close combat so if you know society broke down and we went back to a 19th century level of mayhem kind of like mad max meets the crimean war Absolutely, um, uh, obviously firearms, any firearms that you can um, carry, but I would say why not have a shield? Um, it, it's an absolutely awesome thing. Now, shields clearly, as I've talked about in many of my previous videos, can't be carried around easily and conveniently in the way that a buckler can, and that's undoubtedly one of the reasons that bucklers were so popular in the medieval and renaissance periods. But, um, but nevertheless, if you're going into combat and you know you're going into combat, why not have a shield like this. Um, so there we go. I think that a 19th century um, person who doesn't necessarily know how to use a shield, my advice to them would be if you can get a shield, then do, then do take a shield, take, pick a shield up off that, you know, off that battlefield, pick it up. And your basic rule should be to do whatever you're most comfortable doing the way that you're used to comfortably fighting, okay, with the sword that you're comfortable with, but basically keep the shield in front of your body because then it's a protection from, from many different angles um, and it will cover a huge part of your target. And if someone swings at your head, all you have to do is raise it up momentarily to protect your head and that side is now completely guarded and you know the other great thing is having the shield enables you to do 
two things at the same time, which you wouldn't necessarily be able to do um, with the sword alone. So if, say for example, with this type of saber, if someone thrust at you um, at your center of body mass, you're pretty much obliged unless you just move out, move backwards or run away or whatever, you're pretty much obliged if you want to hit them back to stand your ground, guard it, okay, so parry in whichever way you want to do it, uh, parry and then riposte or parry, riposte. If you've got a shield here and someone thrusts at your body, you don't need to guard it with the sword. You could literally um, guard, guard, just stick the shield straight in front of the face or knock the, um, using the edge, knock the thrust aside or guard it aside like that in whatever way you want to do do. Okay, so you guard from the thrust and at the same time hit the person back or indeed guard their thrust and hit their sword arm if you don't want to step in and hit, get close enough to hit them in the head or body or whatever. Um, so it opens up a whole bunch of other options. So you could literally, if you just held it there, it would be a big advantage. But if you want to do basic things with it, there are some really basic things like that, like defending and attacking in the same tempo that pretty much anybody who's experienced the fencing would work out in a matter of seconds. Um, and it also, for example, enables you to attack at someone's legs much more safely. So if we've got a sword alone, the danger of attacking down at someone's legs is always that you expose your upper targets and their legs, thanks to geometry, are further away and they can reach your head. Um, without their legs being in danger by moving backwards slightly. But uh, as we see in Morozzo, for example, in Sword and Rotella, um, if, you faint, if you faint high, like you'd normally do if you want to attack low, which makes it more likely that you can hit them in the legs, if you faint high and then as you go down to the leg, cover the head here, which is what we see in Morozzo, not only does it cover the head, but it covers the line to the sword arm as well. Okay, so it makes it much, much safer to attack legs. So there we go, shields, really, really effective. Um, and uh, even in a 19th century context, potentially even against bullets, but even in a 19th century context, if you could get one on the battlefield, why not have one? Okay, absolutely. And I absolutely can understand why those Indian officers, even in the middle of the 19th century, were still hanging on to their shields. Because against um, sabres and all sorts of hand weapons, bayonets as well, of course, um, extremely effective. And as I've said in previous videos as well, the spear against the sword usually always wins. The bayonet against the sword, usually the bayonet has the advantage. But you give the swordsman a shield as well, and suddenly the advantage goes back towards the swordsman. The shield really tilts the balance and is um, an incredibly potent weapon um, in all periods. And of course, still used today by riot police and um, even the military in some cases as well. Um, so shields, super, super important. And this one from the night shop, I'll stick the link below. Um, I, I highly recommend it. I really like them. I like the size. It's light. It's not over heavy, um, but it's, it's strong. And it kind of looks cool. Um, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed watching and I'll see you folks for the next video. Cheers. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.